Remember from the previous lecture, we looked at wave phenomena in, in water as an analogy for the wave phenomena in quantum fields. And one of the intuitions that I wanted to get across was that if you put a piece of cork into a puddle of water or a lake or something, it will bob up and down, and that gives you a local oscillator. And at every point in space, there is a local oscillator in the case of the water, but the same with fields. Later, we will also study what the quantum analog of a cork is. How can you probe the waves in a quantum field? And the quick answer is you put an atom there, for example. And then as the excitations of a quantum field propagate across an atom, it might excite the atom. And so how the atom reacts could stand for how the cork reacts, or the other way around. <clears throat> OK, but the main picture I wanted to get across is that you can think of such a wave field as consisting of oscillators at every point. And those oscillators are coupled to each other. That's because if you excite it at one point, if you excite one of those oscillators, that will excite the neighboring ones, and you have um, an excitation that spreads. And the same is true for quantum fields, of course. We also looked at how that arises mathematically. And I'll remind you again when we see the equations again, but let me just anticipate it already. It is because of the Laplacian in the Hamiltonian that we have a coupling of neighboring oscillators. OK, so to quantize a, a quantum field, in particular the klein gordon field, worked like this. We had three tasks to quantize the klein gordon field. One was to impose the canonical commutation relations between the phi and the pi, the phi and the phi, and the pi and the pi. Just like in first quantization, you have degrees of freedom q and their canonically conjugate p labeled by some index a, where a could run from 1 to 3 in the case of one particle. So it would be the x, y, and z coordinates. <clears throat> or the a could run through different particles. If you have 100 particles, then a could run from 1 to 300. Just like that is the usual scenario in first quantization, in second quantization, we have analogous commutation relations except that the degrees of freedom are now the amplitudes. It's the amplitude of the cork, how much it goes up and down. That's the phi, phi of x. For every x, you have a degree of freedom. For every x, you have an oscillator. And it's canonically conjugate momentum, which is just phi dot of x. So these are then the canonical commutation relations, which tell us that phi at x is canonically conjugate to pi at x, but not at a different x prime, because there they just commute. OK, so that's one of the three things that we have to solve. The canonical commutation relations need to be implemented. The equations of motion need to be implemented. And the relationship between pi and phi dot, we also call an equation of motion here. That is very much analogous to equations of motion in first quantization for a harmonic oscillator. Namely, q dot is p for every one of the degrees of freedom a. And also the second equation here, the second part of the Klein-Gordon equation, has an analog in first quantization. It's p dot equal to minus k q. Here we have phi dot, phi double dot, <coughs> He has also, you know, this is a q double dot, p dot is q double dot, um, is equal to something times phi. And then we said, OK, that looks similar. The second derivative is proportional to minus something times the function itself, except that for ordinary harmonic oscillators in first quantization, this is a number. It's a spring constant. But for quantum fields, it's not. For quantum fields, we have this expression here, which is not a number. Our interpretation was this. We said, neglect that term for a moment, and look at the Klein-Gordon equation then. 
then <clears throat> we have that the second derivative of phi is equal to minus m squared phi itself at every x, which confirms our intuition that at every x we have a harmonic oscillator. The second derivative is proportional to the amplitude, just a regular harmonic oscillator. But it's not the full truth because we also have the Laplacian. And what does the Laplacian do? Well, it couples neighboring harmonic oscillators. <clears throat> you can think of it this way. <clears throat> Imagine you discretize space. In this case, the derivatives become finite difference operators. In fact, not only differences between neighbors, but also next to next neighbors, because the Laplacian has second derivatives in it. So what this means is that this is a system of harmonic oscillators, one for each x, but there are also terms that mix them. Think of the derivatives as being implemented through the Newton-Leibniz limit, except that the limit is not taken, if you assume that space is discrete. And then you clearly see that, the that there are terms in here which contain not only the phi of x, but also the phi of x plus epsilon of the Newton-Leibniz limit, where epsilon is the distance to the nearest neighbor. So what we have here is coupled harmonic oscillators. OK, so this was the second set of equations that we have to solve, commutation relations being the first, equations of motion being the second, with this complication that it's harmonic oscillators all right, but coupled ones. And then the third set of equations that we have to obey is this realness condition. The klein gordon field is real, and that means that phi star of x is phi of x, just like a water wave, it has a real valued amplitude. And once quantized, the phi will be operator valued because the commutation relations have to hold and only operators can be non-commutative. And then the realness condition translates into the hermeticity condition, which at least ensures that the expectation values are real, even if the phi are not numbers but operators this will ensure that the expectation values are real. OK, so the quantization of a quantum field theory always boils down to these three things, commutation relations, equations of motion, and the appropriate hermeticity conditions. Of course, not every quantum field is Hermitian, like the Dirac field is not. Um, but there may be analogous constraints. Then <clears throat> we had a proposition. We said the equations of motion, namely these two, the relationship between the canonically conjugate momentum amplitude and the amplitude itself, and the klein gordon equation, these two equations of motion actually arise from a Hamiltonian. And that Hamiltonian is this one at the bottom here. This Hamiltonian, it's the integral of a one half and then the canonically conjugate momentum field integrated up. And then here phi, m squared minus Laplacian phi, also integrated up over space, over all of space. This Hamiltonian, together with the usual Heisenberg equations of motion, namely that the time derivative of an observable is given by the commutator of that observable with the Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian with the usual Heisenberg equations of motion gives us, when you work it all out, if you put the H in here and then use the commutation relations, you will find exactly those two equations of motion. We went in detail through the derivation of this part, and this was homework. I hope and it wasn't too difficult. Um, just to remind you of the analogy, in first quantization, the Heisenberg equations of motion are that the derivative of a degree of freedom, or really of any observable, is given by the commutator of that observable with the Hamiltonian, be it q or be it p. And that's very much analogous over here. And this Hamiltonian is analogous to that Hamiltonian, which is just the sum of the Hamiltonians of 
harmonic oscillators, one harmonic oscillator for each degree of freedom A. Except there is a little bit of a discrepancy here, which is that here we just have a constant uh, deriving from the spring constant, it's just an omega squared half. Whereas here, it's not quite that. We have this thing which is not a number, unlike here. So that, again, will be a concern when we actually carry this out in detail. Um, the other issue is not that much of a concern, namely that this is a sum and this is an integral. Um, but we'll have to deal with that as well. It has to do also with the other slight difference, which is that in the commutation relations of first quantization, we have a Kronecker delta over here. And in second quantization, we have a Dirac delta, which, of course, you can't really evaluate at x equal x prime. Okay, so our plan was to go to proceed in four steps, and we've concluded now um, with the previous lecture and as far as we got today, the first three parts. Uh, I record properties of harmonic oscillators, then we went to the Klein Gordon field and second quantized it. And by that I mean we imposed the conditions, equations of motion, hermeticity, and commutation relations. Now, let's do it in practice. Let's try to solve that problem. And once we do this, we should be able to calculate vacuum fluctuations. And they will be very similar to the ground state fluctuations of harmonic oscillators. OK, let's do this. Well, are there any questions so far? OK, so from the above, apart from the hermeticity condition, we have to solve two kinds of equations. We have to solve the Klein-Gordon equation, and we have to solve the key commutation relations together. Now, how to solve these? See, in principle, I mean, let's, let's see, what does it take? We need to find mathematical objects that have non-trivial commutation relations. So clearly, the phi cannot be number valued. They have to be some sort of operator valued. This is just an ordinary differential equation. No, it's the partial differential equation, but of the usual kind. Um, and in principle, if this wasn't operator valued, we could just solve it analytically. Or if the equation of motion was more complicated, then we could just solve it numerically. You see, if you have a more complicated equation, for example, a more complicated version of the Klein-Gordon equation would be the equations of QCD. In principle, it's just partial differential equations. And you could put that into a computer and solve it numerically. What makes it really hard is that we are not allowed to solve these equations, such as the Klein-Gordon equation, with number-valued functions. We have to solve it with functions that are non-commutative in this way. And that really makes it much more difficult. So how to go about solving these two equations then? <clears throat> the idea that's mostly used is to proceed in analogy with harmonic oscillators again. But even though the analogy is pretty close, there are a few a few things that need to be ironed out until we can really reduce the problem to a bunch of harmonic oscillators. There are three main difficulties, and each one of them comes up in quantum field theory, and especially in quantum field theory on curved space, all the time. So here's the first difficulty in our task of reducing quantum field theory to a bunch of harmonic oscillators. The first one, and we anticipated it already, is that the Klein-Gordon equation 
is analogous to the, Klein, uh, to the uh, first quantized quant um, e harmonic oscillator equation, but the spring constant in first quantization is a number. And in second quantization, it is this. We have an interpretation for that. It means that, yes, we have a harmonic oscillator at every x, but those harmonic oscillators are coupled to each other. But that, does, that intuition doesn't immediately help us solve the problem. It would be much nicer if we had here uncoupled harmonic oscillators, just like these are uncoupled harmonic oscillators. You see, for every A, we get a different differential equation, and one differential equation doesn't communicate with the other. They're completely independent, whereas this one is not, because the second derivatives that are, cont that are contained in here are relating neighboring x values in a differential way, but nevertheless they do. <clears throat> so the key idea then is to perform a transformation such that this effectively becomes a number. And that strategy works well for Minkowski space, and it also works exceedingly well um, in cosmology. So how can we turn that into a number? Can we, um, well, remember that derivatives under Fourier transform become multiplication operators. So the idea is to transform these equations using the Fourier method into a new set of equations that are completely equivalent but take a different form, such that this expression here becomes just a number. Um, now the intuition is this. Remember, originally, we looked at the case of uh, water waves on a lake, and we had the picture of a cork floating somewhere and bobbing up and down. And that was the oscillator. And we had one of those oscillators at every point in space. And those oscillators were coupled, and that was achieved by the Laplacian. So those local field oscillators, and local in, uh, by local I mean local in space, those local field oscillators are coupled to each other. And that meant that excitations are spreading. If you create some waves at some point, if you excite the oscillator, then that will excite the neighboring oscillators, and you'll have a spreading excitation. Now, if you fully transform this, and I have to say, this is not the Fourier transform of that. I just grabbed that, or grabbed that off the internet. It's actually both Einstein condensate. But um, imagine you Fourier transform a wave field like this. Then it might look like that. If you look at this closely, you might recognize a little bit of a tendency for waves um, like that, perhaps. If not, let's just imagine we have that. <laughs> so imagine that there is almost a plane wave propagating on top of the noise. How would that look like? I mean, a standing wave. Let's say a standing wave. Let's say this is in a cavity, and let's say in a tank, and there's a standing wave somewhere. That standing wave would show up in the Fourier transform. There are two contributions then to the Fourier transform. There's the overall noise, the overall bobbing up and down of everything. And that in the Fourier transform might look like this. But then we also have a plane wave, a standing plane wave, let's say. That would have significant Fourier contributions somewhere in momentum space. And that could be represented by those two peaks here. It would always be two peaks, by the way. And that's because in the case of water waves, you know, they're real valued. And remember that if you take a real valued function and you fully transform it, then it always has positive frequencies and negative frequencies in equal measure. So always phi of k is equal to phi star of minus k. So this would be roughly the representation 
in Fourier space of the same wave field. But there's a key difference between the behavior of this picture over time and that picture over time. See, if you create some large amplitude over here, it will spread. If you create a large amplitude over here, it will not spread. <clears throat> now, everybody knows what it means to have a large amplitude at some point here. But what does it mean to have a large amplitude at some point over here? Well, it means that we have, let's say, a plane wave propagating like this through the picture. And this plane wave, and imagine it to be a standing wave in the case of a cavity or a tank, or imagine, imagine it to stretch all the way from this infinity to that infinity, such a plane wave is not going anywhere. I mean, it's not changing over time. Such a plane wave is just bobbing up and down. It's a harmonic oscillator, all right, but it's just bobbing up and down, but it's not creating waves of a larger wavelength, it's not creating waves of a smaller wavelength, it's not creating waves of a different direction. Right? So if you have a plane wave sitting in there, in the Fourier picture, it shows up as a peak, and that peak stays where it is. If it moved, it would mean that the wavelength is changing, or that the direction of the wave is changing, but it's not moving. That is key. That's the intuition for why, when we Fourier transform, we will have harmonic oscillators that are decoupled, that are independent of another. Later in cosmology, it will be similar, but a bit more non-trivial, because then we will have such a picture, but it's expanding. Now the universe is expanding. Now, if you start out with a plane wave of wavelengths five meters, a little later, it will have a larger wavelength, and a later it will have a yet larger wavelength. So those harmonic oscillators are now coupled in momentum space. So simply Fourier transforming wouldn't do the trick in the case of an expanding universe. Instead, we have to do a co-expanding Fourier transform. A Fourier transform that expands the coordinate system along with the expansion of the universe. And then we can capture again every mode as it grows, as an independent mode. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I used the word mode already. A mode is just a Fourier component. That's the terminology for Fourier component. <clears throat> okay, so the key here is in position space, excitations spread. In momentum space, they don't, at least if space-time itself is quiet and just Minkowski space. And otherwise, if it's not Minkowski space, if it's an expanding space-time or a black hole forms, then we will have to adjust our uh, Fourier transform to an analog of Fourier transform that is adapted to the situation at hand so that we can again decouple the degrees of freedom, so that we again get independent harmonic oscillators. And the key here is, of course, we want independent harmonic oscillators so that we can then solve the problem for each of the harmonic oscillators separately and then transform back and put together the original problem. OK, so in Minkowski space, Fourier transform will do the trick. So we Fourier transform with respect to the spatial variables x. By definition, the Fourier transform of phi of x and t is given by this expression. Notice the prefactor of 1 over 2 pi to the power of minus 3 half. <coughs> And the resulting field, the field now in, in momentum space, is called phi hat of k and t. In cosmology and generally in general, general relativity, uh, um, sorry, in quantum field theory in general relativity, for some reason the conventional notation is not to write phi of k and t, but phi index k of t, it's really the same thing. So maybe sometimes we will use this notation, but I think generally I will use that notation here because it's the common notation. Each phi k of t is the Fourier component for a particular wave vector k. Remember that 
k has three indices, it has an index that runs through three values here, the x, y, and z coordinates. And whenever we do not write indices, then it is implied that this is an inner product. So it's really the sum i equal 1 to 3, x i, k i. <clears throat> for each fixed value of k, for each wave vector, for each momentum vector, phi k is called a k mode. It's the k mode. And we will be interested in the dynamics of each one of those phi index k. You see, the phi of x and t had to obey commutation relations, hermeticity condition, and equations of motion. The Fourier transformed field also has to obey commutation relations, hermeticity conditions, and equations of motion, and we should be able to calculate those three from the Fourier transform. After all, this is a bijection. We can map from the phi of x to the phi of k, and vice versa without any loss. And here is the inverse Fourier transform uh, equation, namely the phi k of t with this Fourier factor. Notice that there's no minus sign now, but still a factor of 1 over 2 pi to the power of minus 3 half. <coughs> that gets us back to the original phi. You may wonder, wait a moment. Um, if phi was number valued, I would know how to do this. But this is not number valued, this is operator valued. So, how do I know this still works? Well, it still works because even though phi should be thought of as operator valued, in practice, our Hilbert spaces are separable Hilbert spaces, which means that they have countable bases. And if you use such a countable basis, then the phi can be represented as an infinite by infinite matrix. Basically, what I'm saying is that operators can be represented as matrices, infinite by infinite matrices. And then, this is the Fourier transform for every one of the components of these matrices. And all of that doesn't depend on which basis you use, because both a change of basis and the Fourier transform are linear operations. So it doesn't matter. Um, um, so the Fourier transform doesn't mess up a choice of bases. Here's a proposition, and I'd leave it to you to, to prove it. Um, proposition is that the Hamiltonian under the Fourier transform becomes this expression, very much similar to what we have in first quantization, where we have that the Hamiltonian of a bunch of harmonic oscillators is simply the sum of the Hamiltonians of the individual harmonic oscillators. Now, how would you prove this? How would you prove that this is the right Hamiltonian? Well, all you do is you take the Hamiltonian as we had it before. Where is it? Oof, there it is. Okay, so here's the Hamiltonian, and then we re-express the phi that occurs in here through its Fourier transform, and also we re-express the pi through its Fourier transform. So, and then just work it all out. So in these expressions, we use for phi this expression here. And very similarly, we Fourier transform, of course, the pi field. You could just replace the phi k by pi k. So we if replace all occurrences of phi of x and pi of x in the Hamiltonian by this, and then work things out. <coughs> and then the proposition is that this is the expression that you obtain for the Hamiltonian, where, and this is what we were after, this expression here, which used to be, before the Fourier transform, Laplacian uh, minus Laplacian plus m squared, this expression has now become k squared plus m squared, where k squared is, of course, k1 squared plus k2 squared plus k3 squared. And now this is a number 
for every one of those harmonic oscillators, for every fixed k, for every mode k, this is the Hamiltonian of a harmonic oscillator. One half momentum squared plus one half a number times the elongation squared. Okay, so we solved that problem. It seems we now have decoupled harmonic oscillators. The proposition goes on. It says that the Hamiltonian after the Fourier transform is this, and the canonical commutation relations after the Fourier transform, um, they take this, for, this form. And again, the way to prove it is to just take the canonical commutation relations between the phi of x and the pi of x, and then replace the occurrences of phi of x and pi of x by their Fourier integrals, and then work it all out, you obtain this. And also, the proposition says that under the Fourier transform, the um, hermeticity situation is now, just a sec, oh no, these are the equations of motion, Hamiltonian and canonical commutation relations, and the um, equations of motion. And the equations of motion are that phi k dot is pi k, and pi k dot is minus k squared plus m squared times this. So we seem to have succeeded here. For every mode, that is for every um, wave vector k, we seem to have an independent harmonic oscillator. And its frequency, omega k, is square root of k squared plus m squared, just by comparison with what we have from first quantization. Well, we solved one problem now. But it turns out we have two more. Oh, by the way, um, uh, please show as an exercise that um, <coughs> these equations of motion really follow from that Hamiltonian using the usual Heisenberg equations of motion, namely that the time derivative of an observable f is given by 1 over i h bar, the commutator of f with h. Okay, so we solved one problem. We decoupled those harmonic oscillators. But then we created another problem. Notice that the commutation relations after the Fourier transform look like this. See, they looked innocent here. Here they are, canonical commutation relations. The phi commute with another, and the pi commute with another, and the phi and pi don't, and there's a direct delta on the right-hand side. It looks all fine. But it isn't. It isn't because, you see, when is this thing peaking? Well, it will peak when k is equal to minus k prime, not when k is equal to k prime. That's not how it's supposed to be. In first quantization, when we have a degree of freedom, qa, with its canonically conjugate momentum, pa prime, then, well, whenever a is equal to a prime, that's when the, de the Kronecker delta is peaking. This one doesn't. So there seems to be a bit of a, um, a problem there. Um, and that's not even all of it. There's also the phenomenon that the Kronecker delta, when it does peak, is 1. And the Dirac delta, when it does peak, is infinite. Well, strictly speaking, you know, it's a distribution. You can't even read off its amplitudes. So, these two problems need fixing. Let's start with the, the problem that the Kronecker delta is 1 when it peaks, and this is infinite or ill-defined when it peaks. And then later, we'll worry about the minus sign that we want here. The strategy for solving that issue of reducing a Dirac delta to a Kronecker delta um, I mean, there are several strategies. One would be to work only with operators that are being smeared over. 
So you multiply your field with a weight function and then you get a smeared version and it turns out that then commutation relations are much better behaved and we will pursue this strategy at some point later on in this course. But a more common and simpler strategy is to put the system into a large box. And by large, I mean really large. It could be as large as the galaxy, or maybe 10 to the 100 gazillion light years. The point is that if we make the box very large, then we achieve two things. First, it doesn't matter that it is a box, because if the boundaries of the box are so far away, then the boundaries cannot possibly affect the local physics. So we should be OK with making predictions, even on the basis of the physics happening of a, in a large box, if the box is only very large. But secondly, we will achieve that instead of Fourier transform, we can now use the Fourier series. Remember that when you have a function on a finite interval, then you still have the option of doing a Fourier transform. But you can also now take a Fourier series of it. For functions on an interval, you can do that. For functions on an interval, it is sufficient to know the Fourier series coefficients, and that's a discrete set of them. And then you can reconstruct by inverse Fourier, tr Fourier series transform what the function is on the interval. And that will be the trick here. So what we do is, <coughs> Um, uh, a three-part strategy. We put the system into a large box um, of size L in each direction. Yes? How, like, what about the shape of the boundary? Because the boundary, you're picking a box, but I could have picked any compact region that encloses it and would discrete, but I'm not sure if you'd get the same. I'm not sure how much it depends on the shape of the boundary. Well, if... <clears throat> I'm, I'm choosing a box here, a rectangular box, yeah. because that's the simplest mathematically. Because in this case, the Fourier series will simply be three Fourier series, one in the x direction, one in the y, one in the z direction. If you choose a box that is not rectangular, but has some weird volume, then it too will have a finite set of eigenfrequencies. Right? This will be the overtones of the resonances of this huge box. Um, but the physics will be the same, because the boundaries are extremely far away. And also notice that if the box is very large, those resonance frequencies will be extremely close to another. The larger the box, the closer will be the resonance frequencies. And so it turns out that you can show that in the limit for infinitely large box, if you, if you choose it suitably, if you don't omit a particular direction, for example, and you will always get back Fourier transform. OK, so we choose a large rectangular box for simplicity, just for mathematical convenience. Obviously, this procedure would break rotational invariance, for example. We could choose a sphere. If we did this, we would not break rotational invariance. And then instead of a Fourier series transform, do you know what we would get? Sorry, harmonics, exactly. And, and that's what is done, for example, in cosmology for the CMB. Right, so we put the system into um, a rectangular box. We assume periodic boundary conditions because in the literature that's what's usually done. It's not actually the most convenient thing to do in practice. It has only one advantage, which is that this is the case that most smoothly reduces to the ordinary Fourier transform case when you let the size of the box go to infinity. So. <clears throat> We didn't have to choose that. We don't have to choose periodic boundary conditions. And for the project for this course, I'm suggesting that you use not periodic boundary conditions, but Dirichlet boundary conditions, which say that the field is vanishing at the boundary of the box. For the physics, it makes no difference. But mathematically, it will be much easier, as I will explain in a few slides. But for now, let's use periodic boundary conditions, because almost everybody in the literature does so. <clears throat> 
And then in the third part, we say, OK, periodic boundary conditions. So we have now a finite size box, and we can use Fourier series transforms instead of Fourier transforms. Um, this procedure, by the way, is called um, this procedure of putting the system into a box is called infrared. It's an example of infrared regularization. Not all infrared regularizations are box regularization, but every box regularization is called an infrared regularization. Infrared, because infrared conjures up the image of long wavelengths, longer than we can see. Now, of course, that's usually just like micrometers or so, but um, in the context of quantum field theory, infrared means everything in the limit of large wavelengths or large distances. And ultraviolet would be everything to do with extremely small distances or very large momenta. <clears throat> OK, so this will be the, the strategy here. And in practice, it works out like this. Um, we now have um, wave vectors with components k1, k2, k3, which no longer run through R3. Not all wave vectors are allowed anymore, but instead only those. 2 pi over L, and the n's are integers. The volume is, um, I denote uh, the volume L to the power 3 of the box by V. <clears throat> and then the Fourier series expansion of our quantum field phi hat of x is given by this. Now we integrate just over the box. The normalization factor is 1 over square root of the volume, e to the power minus i x k. And then we get these Fourier series coefficients, where now the k, remember, no longer runs through R3. Momentum space is no longer continuous. Momentum space is discretized in this way. Integers, and then 2 pi over L. If L grows larger and larger, then this becomes a continuum, right? because the spacing goes down like 1 over L. Spacing between the components of neighboring components of the um, what is now momentum space. And there is an inverse um, to this transformation. Namely, we can get back our phi of x for all x in the box by taking the phi k and multiplying it with the Fourier factor and then summing over all k. It's now a sum instead of an integral, because if you remember, the k, the k vectors are no longer elements of R3, not, no longer all elements of R3, but only elements of this discrete grid, this discrete lattice. Momentum space is a discrete lattice now. So what we can do now is again go back to the original problem of quantum field theory, namely equations of motion, canonical commutation relations, and hermeticity, and plug for every occurrence of phi of x, we plug this into the equations. For every occurrence of pi of x, we plug the analog for pi uh, in there. And then the quantum field theory, the problem of quantum solving quantum field theory in the box becomes this one. The Hamiltonian takes this form, where we now no longer have an integral, but a sum. The reason is that we no longer have a continuum of modes, no longer have a continuum in momentum space, but instead we have that we have a grid in momentum space. And at every one of those points on the grid, we have an independent harmonic oscillator with frequency square root of k squared plus m squared. Very much analogous to first quantization. Also, um, if we now work out the new formulation of the canonical commutation relations, we find that they now have a Kronecker delta on the right-hand side. So that really we have um, the usual kind of uncertainty principle, for example, where we have um, h bar half on the right-hand side of the uncertainty principle between the phi and the pi. It's a 1 instead of an infinity. So it looks like we are in business, but, uh, oh, and the equations of motion are just these. Um, no, pi is phi dot, and the kind of equation. So that's all fine, except we still haven't solved the problem of that minus sign here. 
right? It doesn't look like the pi k is the canonical conjugate to the phi k. It's the pi of minus k that's the canonical conjugate to the phi k, because that's when the conical delta is peaking. Okay, so so far we've solved two problems. We decoupled the harmonic oscillators by using Fourier transform, or better, Fourier series transform. And secondly, by using the Fourier series transform, we also turned a Dirac delta into a Kronecker delta. But there is this minus sign. That's the um, third difficulty. And it really traces back to the problem of meeting also the hermeticity conditions. Notice that originally the problem was this. The real valued Klein Gordon field should become a self adjoint operator valued Klein Gordon field when quantized. Same for the canonically conjugate momentum field pi. But when you Fourier transform those two equations, then they become these two equations. Right? Whenever you have a self adjoint operator valued field or Think for a moment, just a real valued field. And the Fourier transform, this condition is what it obeys. In momentum space, it obeys this. Phi star, is, phi star of k is not phi of k. It's not real valued. It's phi of minus k. And the same for pi. So no wonder that there is some mix-up here between the k and the minus k. Oh, and within the brackets here, in case you're not familiar with this, I... I wrote it up so that you can do the calculation yourself <clears throat> to see why realness in the position domain implies this condition in momentum space. That's the equation for it. So the problem is that um, these equations do not um, match what we would expect from first quantization, namely that degrees of freedom are self-adjoint or real. You see, if 5k is a degree of freedom, how come it's not real? Position operators, momentum operators, general observables ought to be real or self-adjoint. But our 5k and pi k are not permission. And correspondingly, we have that the pi k is not the canonically conjugate to the phi k. That's this minus sign. Now, at this point, Mukhanov just, um, I mean, the same discussion is, or similar discussion is also in the textbook by Mukhanov and Vinitsky, but at this point, they just gloss over it, and they deal with it as if we had harmonic oscillators with, with complex amplitudes, which is not quite clean. So here is a proper treatment of it, and I'm not just doing it to be pedantic here, but I want to show you that there are some real difficulties coming up that can be overcome, but there's an ambiguity, and that ambiguity is totally crucial. That ambigu ambiguity is at the heart of why there is Hawking radiation, at the heart of why there is an amplification of quantum fluctuations in cosmology. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. Our overall aim has been to decompose the quantum field into a bunch of independent harmonic oscillators. And we almost succeeded, except that we ran into this minus sign. So now, let's start with those harmonic oscillators. Let's start with harmonic oscillators that eventually we want to recognize as the ones that we can decompose our quantum field into. So let's define new variables qk and pk. So for every mode, we now define a degree of freedom q and a degree of freedom of p, and we will later try to relate them to the phi and the pi. Right? But for now, let's just say that at every point in momentum space there, we define um, a degree of freedom and its canonical conjugate, and we just define these degrees of freedom to be harmonic oscillators. So we are looking at what we are aiming for, right? 
So for now, it's just a plain definition. We will have to link it up with what we did before in a moment. So for every point in momentum space, and it's a discrete momentum space now, we have these degrees of freedom with their canonically conjugate momenta. And we make them harmonic oscillators. So we say that pk is q dot and p dot is minus omega k squared qk. We um, impose the usual commutation relation where it's just chronicle delta of k and k prime. And we impose hermeticity. QK dagger is QK, and PK dagger is PK. This is what we were aiming for. I'm just spelling out what we were aiming for. A harmonic oscillator sitting at every point in momentum space, an independent harmonic oscillator sitting at every point in momentum space. And then, I just give away the solution. It turns out that the phi K, the, um, the field, um, amplitude, the quark, but Fourier transformed, right? So the phi k, the amplitude at a point in momentum space, can be written in this way. It's one half q k plus q minus k plus i over two omega k and then p k minus p minus k. It's a little complicated. We will later see how we can derive such things. But for now, Let's view this as a definition. Let's say phi k, we write down a phi k, which is expressed in this way in such local, in momentum space, local harmonic oscillators. My claim is that this phi k obeys the hermeticity conditions, obeys the canonical commutation relations, and the equations of motion the proper ones that quantum field theory demands. This will obey the weird hermeticity condition where phi k dagger is phi of minus k, the commutation relations where there is this extra minus sign, and it will obey the proper Klein-Gordon equation. All of this comes out as it should, but it's expressed in terms of degrees of freedom that are just innocent and you know, uncoupled and have the usual commutation relations and usual equations of motion. Rarely do people use this. But it's a cleaner way to, to do it. Because now we've really reduced, I mean, you have to put it in there. You have to actually put this ansatz with these equations into all occurrences of phi k and verify that it's true what I said. That really this phi k along with its pi k, which you get by just taking the tan derivative of it and then correspondingly take the tan derivative over there, obeys all the conditions that we formulated for the quantum field theory. It's really done this way, but if you do it, you see that you can really truly reduce um, a quantum field completely into its constituent harmonic oscillators. There are, however, a few important lessons to to learn from that. I mean, other than taking it as an exercise to verify that, that this is all true. One is, in practice, this is a bit of an overkill. It's too complicated. It turns out that in practice, when you want to re reduce the field into a bunch of uncoupled ordinary harmonic oscillators, you don't actually go through the trouble and express it as we did here in terms of Q's and P's of those independent harmonic oscillators. In practice, we remember that harmonic oscillators can be conveniently expressed in terms of A and A dagger operators. And when you express your phi k in terms of the a and A dagger operators of the independent harmonic oscillators, this formula becomes much simpler. And that's because basically that's an annihilation and that's a creation operator. It turns out, as we will see later on in this course, um, when you define the annihilation operator or the lowering operator to your, X and, uh, to your uh, P and Q, 
sorry, this should be a Q here, uh, in this way, then this formula simply becomes that phi k is given as the sum of the annihilation or the lowering operator of one harmonic oscillator and the raising operator of another. So it looks, it doesn't necessarily have to look so complicated. If you express it, you can express the field oscillators in terms of the A and A dagger of independent harmonic oscillators um, more easily. So one lesson is that yes, you can decompose your quantum field completely into proper ordinary quantum harmonic oscillators that are uncoupled and have all the usual commutation relations, hermeticity conditions, and equations of motion. And then this is how it looks like. And secondly, in practice, we don't do it because for quantum fields, it's easier to express the field not in terms of the Q's and the P's, but in terms of their A and A daggers. Then this formula becomes just this one, much easier. Also, the A and A dagger in quantum field theory will play the role of creation and annihilation operators of particles. So not only will it be mathematically simpler, but also have an immediate intuition. The second, um, the second lesson, well, I get to it in a moment. Let me just uh, spell out what the exercise is for you to, to work out. So uh, if you want to, to try your hand at an exercise, then, well, prove this. Prove that this is really decomposing. This equation A is decomposing the quantum clang gordon field into independent harmonic oscillators. Um, and to prove that this really works, plug in these ansatz into the equations and show that the Hamiltonian of the quantum field turns out to be simply this, the sum of independent harmonic oscillators, that the equations of motion are really obeyed, the canonical commutation relations come out correctly with the minus sign, and the hermeticity condition comes out as it should be. And, you know, we assumed in all of this that the Q and the P are just ordinary harmonic oscillator degrees of freedom. Um, yeah, and then what you can do is you can solve, you know, <laughs> the, the benefit of doing this is that in principle, now that we've reduced the quantum field theory to just a bunch of ordinary harmonic oscillators, we can now reverse engineer things. We can take those ordinary harmonic oscillators and put them into some arbitrary quantum states and then work out backwards what that is for the quantum field theory. You see, you can prove now from this transformation here, from, from oh, from this and the inverse Fourier series transform that the quantum field phi hat of x, which obeys the correct Klein-Gordon equation, which obeys the correct hermeticity conditions, and which obeys the correct commutation relations, can be expressed in this form, where the Q's and the P's are just ordinary harmonic oscillators. For example, you could put now those harmonic oscillators all into their ground state. And then ask, well, what does that mean for the quantum field? What kind of state is that? And we will identify that state with the vacuum state of the quantum field, when all of those harmonic oscillators are in their ground state. The picture is... Is this. Okay, so remember we started with this representation here. We had a position representation in mind for the quantum fields. And in this case, we had a harmonic oscillator at every point, but those harmonic oscillators were coupled to each other through the Laplacian. And then we said, okay, let's go to the Fourier domain 
And in the Fourier domain, we have again a harmonic oscillator sitting at every point in the in momentum space. We discretize momentum space, but never mind, that's not so important. So at every point in momentum space, we have a harmonic oscillator. And with the final step, we actually cleanly identified what those harmonic oscillators are, the things with the Qs and the P. And then we said that they are completely independent. And in particular, if they don't oscillate, or oscillate as little as possible, so in particular, the expectation value of the elongation of those harmonic oscillators may be zero, and with the uncertainty as small as possible, that the ground state of these harmonic oscillators, then we would expect that um, that is the closest possible to the vacuum state, the closest, the closest possible to no excitation of the quantum field. But of course, these quantum harmonic oscillators are fluctuating. And therefore, if you translate their fluctuations using the uh, definitions and the inverse Fourier series transform into what the measured values would be for the phi, you get quantum fluctuations of the field. We will do that in much more detail um, a little later. But um, uh, the point I wanted to make is that um, the vacuum state will be the state where all of those constituent harmonic oscillators are in their ground state. Okay. But now, to the second lesson, and that's why I did it with, you know, painstaking detail here. Remember this ansatz here? We said that the quantum field phi k can be decomposed into truly independent, ordinary quantum harmonic oscillators using this formula. And it doesn't look obvious. A question that we should ask is, is it even unique? Could it be that some other fancy combination of the Qs and the Ps might also do the trick? And it turns out, yes, there's a continuum of, po of possibilities. The possibility that I gave you here is the one that works out correctly for Minkowski space. If you are an inertial observer in Minkowski space, this is the correct thing to do. But there are other ways to do it. There are other ways to express phi k in terms of independent harmonic oscillators with degrees of freedom, let's call them q tilde k and p, uh, p tilde k. And again, the commutation relations, the hermeticity condition, and the equations of motion would hold. It's not unique. But this seems to jeopardize everything that we said in the past few minutes. You know, I try to explain the idea that once we've expressed the quantum field, once we've decomposed it into independent harmonic oscillators, one for every point in momentum space, then we know what the vacuum is. The vacuum is simply the ground state of all those harmonic oscillators. It's also automatically the state of lowest energy, because the total energy is given by the total Hamiltonian. And if you look at the ground state of each one of those Hamiltonians, it has the least energy it can possibly have. The sum will also have the least energy it can possibly have. So the lowest energy state is the state in which all of those harmonic oscillators are in their ground state. That ought to be the vacuum. But now, I just said that this is not unique. There are other ways. Put, in a, put a tilde on the Qs and the Ps and rearrange those coefficients and it still works. You still get a phi k that obeys the three conditions of hermeticity, commutation relations, and klein gordon equation. But for these q tildes and p tildes now, well, you get a different set of harmonic oscillators. And their ground state will not be the ground state of the q's and the p's. In fact, what is the ground state or the vacuum for one choice will not be the vacuum for the other. It will be an excited state. And when a quantum field is excited, it means particles are around. And that would mean the vacuum is not unique. Different ways to, do, to decompose 
a quantum field into its constituent harmonic oscillators. And each of those decompositions gives us a different notion of vacuum. And one choice, one identification of the vacuum doesn't agree with the other. What is one person's vacuum is another person's excited state. This will be crucial. Um, it will turn out that the physics determines in ways that it's too early to explain, but the physics will determine which choice to make and therefore how to identify the vacuum state. And therefore, it can be that, um, for example, early on in some process, one way of writing this is the correct way, identifies the vacuum. But later on in the, in the same process, another way might be the right way to do it. And there may be a continuum. You might have to go through a continuum over time of changing this identification. And that means that if you started with a vacuum, you might end up with an excited state. For example, in the case of black holes, that's, how it, that's basically how it works. Before the black hole forms, you do it one way, after the black hole has formed, you do it another way, and what used to be the vacuum state is no longer the vacuum state later on, and then you have Hawking radiation present. Also in, um, in cosmology, if the universe is just starting out in the vacuum, the expansion can trigger that we have to do this decomposition differently later on, and then we will find that there will be particles or um, in any case, excitations of the field. It turns out that not always can the excitation of a field be interpreted as the presence of particles. Sometimes the very concept of particles fails. Anyway, so the, the ambiguity here in identifying or in completely decomposing a quantum field into independent harmonic oscillators <coughs> uh, is important because that identification comes with a notion of vacuum. And if that's not unique, then we can have particle creation in non-trivial ways. OK, so the significance of the non-uniqueness is that the ground state of the Q and the P oscillators gives us the vacuum. But this vacuum may or may not be the lowest energy state of the quantum field theoretical Hamiltonian. You see, the quantum field theoretical Hamiltonian has a lowest energy state. But depending on the physics, we may have to identify the phi k in terms of harmonic oscillators whose ground state is not that ground state. This will be at the heart of much of what we do in this course. OK, so for now, we solved using this particular choice of ansatz that we had in equation A, um, the, the, um, the quantum field theoretical equations, namely, for now, let's just take it for granted that by doing this, we have one way of solving the equations of motion, the hermeticity, and the canonical commutation relations. And it's the correct way if what you do is quantum field theory in Minkowski space and you are not accelerated. It turns out that when you're accelerated, that's not your choice. Um, I think it will be lecture eight when you will see that uh, an accelerated observer in Minkowski space will see particles where a non-accelerated observer will not see particles. Is it always possible to find the, the right Q's and P's that will give us the right ground state? Maybe, but generally we don't know. We don't have a way of identifying it. It turns out that in the case of cosmology, we have a very good hunch what the right identification is. And we will go through that in, in great length and detail because it's so important. But um, but that's based on an idealization where we have homogeneous isotropic space-time that's just expanding. If you have a, a generic space-time that may be expanding here and shrinking over there, and there might be black holes around and all that stuff, then nobody knows how to do it. And 
It's worse than that. There probably isn't a vacuum state. There just isn't. I mean, depending on how you want to define the vacuum state, you could define the vacuum state as a state of lowest energy, but that's a poor choice because the state of lowest energy, generically, one can prove, has particles in it. But do you want to call a state with particles the vacuum state? Probably not. But then, if you try to identify the vacuum state as a no particle state, <clears throat> then in general, there may simply not exist such a state. A no particle state may generally not exist if the universe is complicated. So it's you know, non isotropic and non homogeneous and expanding and shrinking and all that. Then there is generally no state that would be a no particle state. So vacuum state does not necessarily mean the state with lowest energy. That's right. Okay. That much we are sure, and we will see exactly why. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, so we have to give up on the idea that the vacuum state is a state of lowest energy. We would like to rescue the idea, at least, that the vacuum state is a state of no particles. But that's probably not salvageable. Um, it's not just. An aesthetic quest, we want to know what is the state of no particles. I mean, there are particles around, right? So why would you necessarily care about that state? No, it's a fundamental question because it boils down to what we choose as the initial state of the universe. Maybe not at time t equals zero, but very, very early on. What state would the universe be in? And the vacuum state is a natural choice, especially if the universe really came mushrooming out of another universe. Then, to, due to this huge expansion, very fast expansion, you would expect that whatever particles might have been there early on would be completely diluted by the enormous volume that's being created. So it is a natural assumption to say, well, the universe or the daughter universe started out in the vacuum state. But what is that vacuum state? If we could pinpoint what it is, it would be really helpful for making predictions. And it turns out that the predictions that we make, for example, for the cosmic microwave background, are extremely sensitive to getting the assumption for the initial state of the quantum field right. <coughs> it's not a small thing. It depends very, very crucially on that. Which is why uh, quite a number of studies in quantum gravity are trying to calculate what the impact of quantum gravity might have been on that initial state, on the initial state of, um, of the inflaton field. Um, I was one of the first to write papers on that in 2001. Um, OK, so, so then once we have identified, or once, once we have decompose the quantum field into constituent harmonic oscillators, then we should be able to calculate whatever we want, because we can solve harmonic oscillators. So we should be able to calculate now the dynamics, the kinematics, everything about the quantum field. After all, it's just infinitely many ordinary harmonic oscillators, each one of which has just degrees of freedom qk and pk, and the total Hamiltonian is this one. These are the frequencies, the, uh, the, um, the points in momentum space, the wave vectors are restricted to this grid here because we have an infrared regularization. Um, well, and in order to get started with the quantum physics, we, um, we choose now a state of those quantum harmonic oscillators. So we've decomposed our quantum field into independent harmonic oscillators, and now we assume that they are in some state. Let's call it psi. That's the state of all of those infinitely many harmonic oscillators. For example, let's say they're all in their lowest energy state. Preliminarily, let's call this state the vacuum state. I already gave it away that we will not be able to maintain that definition. But in Minkowski space, as an inertial observer, you get away with that. For ordinary particle physics, as it is done at CERN, it's fine. Lowest energy state is the no particle state, is the vacuum state. So that's one possibility. But of course, you could also choose that some of the harmonic oscillators are in excited states. They might be in the fifth excited state, or 
one of the harmonic oscillators might be in a linear combination of the third and the 27th excited state. In total, the tensor product of the states of the individual harmonic oscillators gives you the total state of the assembly of all of those harmonic oscillators, and that's the state psi. Given that state psi, so given which state um, all these harmonic oscillators are in, and by the way, you can also have them entangled, right? So psi might be an entangled state of all those individual harmonic oscillators. It doesn't have to be a tensor product of the states of the individual harmonic oscillators. It could also be a linear combination of such um, states. So once we know what this assembly of harmonic oscillators what state it is in, then we can calculate the probability or probability amplitudes or probability amplitude density for finding those harmonic oscillators with particular elongations or momenta. We can calculate the Q's and the P's probability distributions. So for example, we know that if one of those harmonic oscillators is in its ground state, so let's say if the field is assumed to be in a vacuum state, so if all its constituent harmonic oscillators are assumed to be in their ground state, then the probability distribution of the QK amplitudes, and also of the PK, because both are Gaussian, will be Gaussian. Right? And so um, we can calculate then from the probability amplitudes or the probabilities for the Qs and the Ps, we can calculate also the probability distributions for the phi's and for the pi's. Right? Because the phi's, the phi k and the pi k are just linear combinations of the pk and the qk. The probability distributions for the p's and the q's translate into probability distributions for the phi's and the pi's. It's a little messy perhaps, but it can be done. Um, and then one finds, for example, and we will, uh, in the next lecture, calculate this by yet some other way. You can calculate then, for example, when the harmonic oscillators, the constituent harmonic oscillators are in their ground state, you can calculate what the probability distribution for the values of the phi k are. Remember the phi k are complex numbers. I mean, they are really, you know, operator valued, but you can calculate now the probability distribution for both the real and the imaginary part of it. It turns out that you can decompose it into a, um, an amplitude and a phase, and the phase is uniformly distributed, and all you need to know is, and, and the only thing that's non-trivial is the, um, the modulus of phi k, and here it is. The probability for finding, if you measured all of the harmonic oscillators, or actually, if you measured all of the phi k, if you measured the real and imaginary values of the phi k, if you had a measurement instrument to, to measure these, then this would be the probability distribution. It's not normalized. Uh, it's non-normalized probability distribution for finding particular values of phi k is given by this. It's straightforward to calculate, but a little tedious. And um, let's look at what this says. What we've done is we've taken all those constituent harmonic oscillators, put them in the, into, the, into their ground state, which implies probability distributions for their observables, which then implies probability distributions for the phi k. And here they are. What, for example, is the probability for finding a tremendously large phi k? I mean, the modulus of it large. I mean, remember, these are Fourier series coefficients, so they're complex numbers. Let's say the modulus is very large. How likely is it to find a phi k that is tremendously large? Well, let's see. e to the power of minus omega k, and then we have phi k times phi k star. So if phi k is very large, phi k times phi k star is very, very large. 
So it's very much suppressed. What we see is that it's unlikely to find a large amplitude of the K mode. And a small amplitude phi is much more likely to happen. In fact, the larger the amplitude is, the more it is suppressed, more than exponentially, because this is a Gaussian. It's a complex Gaussian. From this, we can now calculate how quantum fluctuations look like in the vacuum. Remember that picture here? This is how a lake looks like in its ground state on a day with mild conditions. The waves are not particularly large and so on. A quantum field similarly always has waves. Now for a lake it really takes fish or ducks or wind to create waves. For uh, for a lake, it does take that, for, but for a quantum field, it doesn't. A quantum field always fluctuates. And using what we just calculated, or using what we just calculated, we can, cal we can now produce pictures like that, like that for the lake. We can now produce pictures like that for a quantum field. We now, ha we now have a means to calculate the probability distribution for Fourier series coefficients phi k. But when we have a probability distribution for the Fourier series coefficients, then we can draw from that probability distribution. We can, with a little trick, uh, with some tricks, uh, numerical tricks, uh, we can ask Mathematica or Maple or some self-written code to produce random numbers that are distributed in the way that we just calculated. And then we draw from that probability distribution. This is what you would do if you actually went out and measured a quantum field. So we consider, for example, the vacuum state, and then we draw phi k coefficients from their probability distribution as quantum calculated. And then those phi k are complex numbers, but by Fourier transform, we get the phi of x from that. And that phi of x, we can then plot on the machine. And that's how it will look like. Of course, if you run the computer again, it produces different random numbers, and it will produce a different picture. But they will all be from the same probability distribution. So you will get typical impressions of how a quantum field looks like. And that's pretty much the analog of what the lake would be, except that quantum fields don't need ducks or wind. <laughs> they just fluctuate anyway. Right? And um, part of the project um, of this course is to do this, uh, to, uh, to play around with this math, and I mean, I will tell more about this in the next lecture, and also um, there is an explanation of it um, on the course website. Basically, calculate um, analogs of that and um, do it for Minkowski space. Do it for Minkowski space with different dimensions. It turns out that the fluctuation spectrum is quite different depending on how many dimensions we have. If you take a three-dimensional space-time and plot a two-dimensional slice through it, you get a different kind of picture, a different statistics from what you would get if you took a two-dimensional space-time to start with. And the higher the dimension is of your space-time, the weirder are the two-dimensional slices going to look like. It's very important. Basically, the fluctuations completely get out of hand if the dimension is larger than 3 plus 1. And then, now, of course, we are not that far yet, try to do these calculations for an expanding space-time and see how those quantum fluctuations are being ripped apart by the expansion. And play around with how the choice of vacuum, how the choice of decomposition of a quantum field into, into its constituents um, affects, uh, again, the picture of the quantum fluctuation.
So I, I'll, I'll give some more explanations um, about this throughout the course, of course, and then also in the explanation of the project on the course homepage. The overall idea is that you get to actually do the calculations and get some intuition for what, what happens um, with quantum fields. Okay, that's it for today. See you on Friday. Are there any questions? I switched off the microphone already. <laughs>